Much have I travelled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his domain. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene, till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. When you hear the name John Wayne, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? For me, it's a mental image of him as the rugged, rough and tough cowboy. But, you know, you may have a different idea. You may think of immediately one of his movies that was a favorite of yours. Or perhaps instead of a single movie, perhaps you're thinking about his career as a whole because his movie career was absolutely extraordinary. It lasted for decades and is one of the longest and most successful of any of the American actors. Thanks to Amanda Taylor, the director of the Concordia Parish Public Library, and her great staff at the library, and the sponsorship of Delta Bank, we're going to be able to have a program today about the life and times of John Wayne. Oh, I'm cold and hungry and wet. Think you can make it, Pilgrim? Pilgrim, you're going to need a couple of stitches. To research all of my programs, I always learn actually more than I'm ever able to tell you. And in this particular program, researching John Wayne's life and career, I learned many, many things that I did not know. I think the most important thing I learned is that there's a lot more to this man than just the movie image that we have, or even the movie career that we are so pleased with. His career, from his point of view, was not always one to be envied. He had some rough spots in his career. Uh, at the beginning, it was very hard for him to get beyond the B-movies, the low-budget films, but eventually he was discovered, and he then had a very phenomenal career. I learned also that there were several people who were very, very instrumental in forming his character and who impacted his life. First, his parents. His father, he absolutely adored. His mother, he absolutely despised. And I'll explain that a little bit later. Actors, Maureen O'Hara, Jimmy Stewart, Henry Fonda, and Clint Eastwood all were very important focus people within his life. But probably the most important person in terms of his career was director John Ford. John Ford became a kind of a, a father figure for John Wayne. For this study, I spent most of my time with one book. It's this one, John Wayne, The Life and Legend. It's by Scott Iman and it was published just in 2015, relatively new. Iman is a, a fine author. He has either authored directly or co-authored with a partner, a total of 15 very fine biographies of books. Uh, he's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and he serves as an adjunct professor at the University of Miami. He's in the Department of Cinema and Interactive Media, and he teaches film history. So this is an educated film scholar who knows what he's looking at and what he's looking for when he's doing a biography of an actor like John Wayne. I recommend this book not only to John Wayne fans, but also to anybody who's interested in the history of the American Western in movies. You know, we've had Westerns for a very, very, very long time. They started in the silent movies. 
And what he does in his book, as he's tracking Wayne's career, he's tracking also the rise and growth in popularity of the American Western. And just as Wayne's career is ending, the public's appetite for the American Western is waning. The Westerns have become dark. They become focused on evil. They become postmodern. And as a result, just the average person finds them depressing and not happy. So if you want to know all about John Wayne and all the ins and outs of his very interesting private life, I'm the books for you. If you want to know about how the American Western came to be in the movie industry and then what happened to it, Iman's book is the book for you. One of the things that was most interesting to me about the Iman book were the personal stories about Wayne, because after all, what you see on the screen, the big screen, you see a person who is a character being portrayed by an actor who's very, very good, but you don't know anything about the actor, the person behind the persona that's on the screen. In this book, you get the inside stories. What happened on the sets in between shoots? What happened in his private life at his famous parties? What happened on his boat? What was going on with John Wayne, the man? There's a great little episode that Iman puts near the beginning of his book when he says the following. One night, Wayne and Red Buttons were outside their tents playing cards after a long day of shooting a film in Africa. Over Wayne's shoulder, Buttons noticed a leopard had walked out of the bush and was moving towards them. Duke, there's a leopard walking towards us, Button said. Wayne didn't turn around. He merely said, Buttons, see what he wants. That's the kind of man he was. Okay, we're gonna start from the beginning. We're gonna look at him from birth to being discovered first. He was born Marion Robert Morrison, and that first name, Marion, gave him a great deal of trouble when he was in school because most of the boys thought that was girls. So he sort of didn't use Mary any, unless he just absolutely had to. So he was Robert Morrison. He was born May 25th, 1907 in Winterset, Iowa at home. And he weighed 13 pounds. His parents were Clyde and Mary Morrison. He had one younger brother and he acquired the nickname The Duke very early. He had an Airedale puppy that he adored when he was a young child, and that was the name of the dog. And so people in their little community started calling him Duke, just like the dog. The parents were the original odd couple. They were opposites. They didn't really like each other all that much, although they obviously loved each other. Uh, and their personalities were in conflict. Everybody loved Clyde, Morrison's daddy. Nobody wanted to be around Molly too much. That was her nickname. They, they kind of tried to avoid her. Clyde was sort of a consistent business failure, and Iman does a great job in the book showing how the family kind of goes from pillar to post. Uh, Clyde does something for a while, and then he fails at that, and then he tries to do something else. Molly, his wife, had come from a fairly well-to-do family, and so much to Clyde's embarrassment, there were times during Wayne's childhood that the parents of Clyde's wife had to sort of give them enough money to keep them alive. One of the peculiar things about John Wayne as an adult is that he absolutely refused to eat tuna fish. He said he'd been poor for so long as a child and they had had to eat tuna fish for so much to stay up for so long to stay alive that he would never eat tuna fish again once he was an adult. The problem within the family dynamic is that the mother greatly greatly preferred the younger brother to our John Wayne. So 
He was the favorite and Robert could do nothing right. In spite of that, Marion's father, Robert's father, with his failures, he still managed to keep a very close relationship with his son and to teach him important values, specifically the work ethic. Because even though the man failed at everything, it wasn't because he wasn't trying and giving it his, his absolute all. Finally, he settled the family down in Glendale, California, where Clyde had a, uh, worked in a drugstore. Marion was an excellent student in high school and was active in student government and he even acted in a couple of the student plays. And he participated uh, rather well in football, well enough that he caught the eye of the University of Southern California and they gave him a football scholarship. He won that scholarship and he played for two years until he and his fraternity brothers got into a little competition with body surfing and he injured his shoulder. So that kind of ended his playing days. While he was in college though, there he is in California and he gets a great break, a tiny one, but it's a break. He starts working in the summers as an extra in films. And actor Tom Mix, who was quite something back then, got him a summer job in exchange for his getting him some football tickets. He was always well behaved. There are no records anywhere that I can find, and believe me, if there had been any, he would have found them, that showed that um, Wayne was anything more than just a prankster on occasion. He really was well behaved. From the seventh grade on, he didn't have time to be bad because he had to earn his own spending money and he had to earn enough money to buy his own clothes. He had a paper route that he got up for at four o'clock every morning. Then he went to school, went to football practice, and then he went to the drugstore and he made drugstore deliveries on his bike until after night. So throughout his life, one of the things that you hear from the actors who worked with him, the directors, the producers, his friends, is that he had the most remarkable work ethic they had ever seen. And that was from born, uh, born from years of, of just not having enough. He was a Boy Scout. Uh, he was on the sports staff of the school uh, newspaper. He worked in the school cafeteria and he loved journalism and he developed a lifelong passion for reading. Look at this list of accomplishments for him. When he graduated Glendale High School, he was president of the senior class, president of the Latin Society, president of the Let Letterman's Club, chairman of the senior dance, which is roughly the prom, chairman of the ring committee, member of the Glendale High School debate team, and he graduated with a 94 out of 100 average. This is not your bumbling, cowboy boot shuffling, slow thinking, slow talking guy. This is an intellect. He was quite bright and it came through. When he was to graduate high school, he was you know, faced with the problem of what am I gonna do? He had thought about enlisting in the Navy uh, but in September before, he was, in, uh, he was able to get a football scholarship in September of the following year after he graduated that spring, he enrolled at Southern Cal. He majored in pre-law. He thought he would become a lawyer. He immediately was elected leader of the Southern Cal freshman debate team. So he was a strong debater in high school. He was a strong debater as a freshman in college and he joined Sigma Chi. He was poor, so he had to take extra measures to exist. For one thing, he learned to cover the holes in the soles of his shoes with cardboard to keep his feet warm. He ch exchanged his work washing dishes and bussing the tables at the frat house for his meals at his frat house. And then he found a job working for the telephone company, locating old telephone lines, and he made 60 cents an hour for that. He was very self-sufficient, 
And that self-sufficiency was extremely important for him through his entire life. He was strong, he was a good athlete, but his coach at Southern Cal said that his only weakness as a football player was that he never really wanted to hurt anybody, and that wasn't good with football. He had idolized his coach, and uh, the main reason was he represented everything that his father wasn't. Marion Robert Morrison slowly becomes John Wayne. At the end of his freshman year at USC, his coach sends him and a couple of other guys over to Fox Studios where Mix is so that Mix can give them a job for the summer. They worked in the prop department and they also occasionally got pulled in and were actually on screen. They were extras. Wayne discovered Douglas Fairbanks and thought he was the finest actor in the whole world because he loved the way he would duel and his stunts. His first film role ever was as a double for another actor in an MGM film, and he was paid $7.50 for it, his first earnings from the movies. In 1926, he was working as an extra for the film Mother Macri. It was being directed by John Ford. That interaction was to impact the remainder of Marion's career. His job was to herd geese that were being used to create a rural atmosphere for this particular film. If the geese were acting, which meant they were waddling down the street during the shoot, then his job was to round them up afterward, put them in a pen and hold them safely until it was the next time that they were gonna be used. For a decade, Wayne would work in a number, quite a few actually, B films. He even tried at one point to be a singing cowboy. In 1930, though, he lands his first leading film role. It's, he's 23 years old, and the name of it is The Big Trail. And you can see from this, this particular portrait of him, he's not the rugged, wrinkled, grizzled, cowboy that we think of. He's a young, really cute guy with a lot of curly hair. He'd been working for some time as a prop man and as an extra when he was needed. And in 1930, director Raoul Walsh spotted him on a set. He asked him if he could do anything other than move props around. And he said, well, he wanted to be in pictures, but he was kind of stuck in props. Walshson asked him what else he could do, and he said, well, he could play football. Walsh laughed and told him to let his hair grow out and come see him in about two weeks, and he did. And at that point, he hired him for $75 a week, which was $40 a week more than he was making as a prop guy and an extra. And at that point, the studio head decided that Marion really wasn't a good name and Marion Robert Morrison really wasn't a showbiz name. So he came up with the name John Wayne, which for him meant masculine. And so from that point forward, we had John Wayne. You can see from these pictures from the big trail, one of the things about Wayne that was always an interesting physical feature of his his hands are abnormally large. They are um, flexible. I mean, they do everything they're supposed to do. They're just, he just had really big hands. Uh, he referred to them as his mitts. His whole life through, he refused to be called an actor. He said that he was a reactor. He lacked the formal training that so many of his colleagues had, and he was a little embarrassed about that. But frankly, he was puzzled why they would take the time, they would earn a part, and then they would create this totally fictional life around this character. And they said they were doing that so their acting would be authentic. Wayne thought that was silly. He said, what you do is listen to the dialogue and you react to it. That's what's authentic. One of the things that Ivan points out in his book is that throughout John Wayne's career, the other people who worked with him 
in whatever capacity, prop men, director, other actors, they all appreciated his sincere concern for them. Here's an excerpt from Iman's book that I think sort of captures that. Iman writes, Wayne leaned across to the actress he was working, working with and said that he was going to stumble over a nail in the next scene, and then he was gonna do it again several more times. Then Lorna Gray said, he stumbled over the nail and Georgie Sherman reset the camera and he tripped a couple of more times. And I wondered why he was doing this. It was such a simple scene. And then I realized he was stalling to kill the five minutes it would take for the extras to go into overtime. That's the kind of man he was, a wonderful man. I said that he was discovered. His first big break came in Stagecoach. John Ford gave him that break, cast him as the Ringo Kid in 1939's movie. The Ringo Kid is an escaped outlaw who joins a group of strangers to move across the frontier. He's gonna kind of get lost in the group. The movie earned seven Academy Award nominations and won two, Music and Supporting Actor. And for Wayne, it marked the first time that he is now recognized as a viable leading man. In 1940, Ford cast Wayne as a Swedish seaman in The Long Voyage Home. This role stretched Wayne, the Swedish accent, he said, drove him crazy. Uh, and, but it also showed his versatility. He's not a cowboy. He's at sea and he's a Swede. He's not an American. It also earned several Academy Award nominations. I love the picture of him with one of his co-actors in the long voyage home. I mean, gone is the cowboy hat, gone is the vest. He's just a seaman through and through. In 1940, Wayne was cast with Marlena Dietrich in Seven Sinners. Wayne plays a naval officer and Dietrich, of course, is the seductress. The pair would go on to make a total of three films, this one, Seven Sinners, then in 42, Pittsburgh, and the spoilers. This is a good time for me to stop and explain something to you about these dates on these movies. This does not mean that the movie was actually shot in 1942. It means that's the date that it was officially released to the public. So there are gonna be several times through Wayne's career that you're gonna notice he has films like two, three, sometimes four films that look like they were all made in the same year. That was not the case. In 1948, Wayne worked with director Howard Hawks in Red River, which was a, a Western drama. Wayne played cattleman Tom Dunson in this one. It's a very complicated role, and it gave Wayne the opportunity to really show real talent as an actor. Later in his life, when Wayne was asked, you know, about which movies were the most important and so forth. He said, well, I'll tell you, the one that I did the best job in was Red River. This movie marked a transition for Wayne. He's no longer gonna be seen as an action hero, big fist fights and you know shootouts and things like that. Instead, he's going to be seen as an actor who may happen to be involved in shootouts and so forth, but his credentials as an actor are confirmed with this film. The next film he does in 49 is Sands of Iwo Jima, and now he's no longer a cowboy. He's not uh, a Swedish seaman. Instead, he's, he's a, a soldier. The Sands of Iwo Jima earned him Wayne, his first Academy Award nomination for Best Actor. He lost it, Robert Crawford won it for All the King's Men. 
He also appeared in two more Westerns working with John Ford, and they're considered today, if you study American Western movie classics, they're considered two of the true classics of that genre. 49's She Wore a Yellow Ribbon and 1950's Rio Grande. Appearing in both of them with Wayne is a wonderful actress named Maureen O'Hara, and she became his lifelong friend. Both, sadly, would die from cancer. Wayne worked with O'Hara in more films. The best one, though, was probably The Quiet Man, 1952. It also <laughs> has him not playing the stereotypical cowboy that he's so often associated with. He plays an American prize fighter, and he has developed kind of a bad reputation, and so he has to move out of America. And he moves to Ireland, and he falls in love with an Irish lass. Critics consider this movie of Wayne's to be the one where he is the most convincing in a romance, as a romantic lead. From 1949 to 1951, everywhere you looked, there was John Wayne memorabilia. He was outselling Hopalong Cassidy, Roy Rogers, and Gene Autry. There were comic books, there were cowboy pistols, there were Western outfits everywhere. In 1952, art mimics life and life mimics art. He appears in the movie Big Jim McLean, and he plays an investigator working for the U.S. House Un-American Activities Committee. At the same time, Wayne was very active with the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals. He was its president. The alliance was made up of conservatives who wanted to keep communists from making films. Joining Wayne in this effort were people like Ronald Reagan and Gary Cooper. This was the toughest time in motion picture industry history so far because it meant that actors and directors who were on opposite sides of these, this controversy still had to find a way to work together and make movies so they could stay alive. In 1956, Wayne is cast again by John Ford. John Ford is the continuum in his career. John Ford comes for him, but only when he has a script that he feels is worthy of Wayne. John, he was asked, Ford was asked one time toward the end of his life, why did he put Wayne in so many of these absolutely great movies of his? And his answer was, John Wayne is the finest actor in Hollywood. That's all. So in 56, he's found another perfect script. It's going to be a Western, and the name of it is The Searchers. He plays Ethan Edwards. He's a Civil War veteran, and he's got, shall we say, questionable morals. And the film was one that Wayne always thought to be one of his best performances, Red River and now The Searchers. I think one of the best sort of inside stories that Ivan reveals is the story about Jim Arness, James Arness. Wayne, like all the others who could figure out how to do it, decided that the way he could make the most money was to create his own production company and he would direct films himself he wasn't very good at it, and he didn't make a lot of money with it, but he tried it, and he, he gave it his all. When he was in the middle of trying to develop his company, of course, he had put, brought online under contract, contract actors who would then be in the things that he decided he was going to produce. In the late 50s, John Wayne turned down the role of Sheriff Matt Dillon, for a proposed television series that was being developed from a radio version of very popular Western Gunsmoke. The pay was going to be $2 million upfront guaranteed plus partial ownership of the shows. 
Wayne didn't want to do it. He wanted to direct. So he suggested that James Arness ought to take the role. He was under contract for uh, John Wayne's production company. And so Arness said, okay, I'll go. And so he went on to play that role for 20 years and made a cool fortune from it. The 1960s were among the most um, fruitful in terms of movie making for John Wayne. 1960 was the Alamo which he directed, which he said when he got about three quarters of the way through shooting that film that he would have to clear, I think it was $17 million to be able to break even. And the film never really did as much as it should have. And at that point, he knew he had to have somebody else take over the production company because that just was not where his talent lay. And he turned to his son, Mike, and it, it worked out very well. Anyway, in 60, the Alamo is produced. Then in 62, the man who shot Liberty Valance. Also 62, The Longest Day. Also 62, How the West Was Won. Again, remember I told you, that doesn't mean that that's when they were actually shot. That means when they were released to the public. Then we have a skip of five years till El Dorado in 1967. What's happening in that gap is John Wayne is facing the biggest crisis of his life, cancer, and he undergoes surgery. We'll get into that a little bit later. He comes back with El Dorado, and then in 68 does the Green Berets. We have him, you know, working again as a soldier. And then in 69, he does True Grit, which I think is one of the finest films he ever did. He plays Rooster Cogburn, which is, has to be the character that every actor would love to have a shot at. He won Best Actor for his performance as this lawman who was drunk more than sober and who wore an eye patch but could still shoot the eyes out of anything, anywhere that he needed. His last film was released in 1976. It's called The Shootist. He co-starred in that one with Jimmy Stewart and Lauren Bacall. He plays a man named John Bernard Books. He's an aging gunfighter who's ill, and he wants to spend whatever time he has left in peace and quiet. And instead, he's forced to engage in one final gunfight. It's a heck of a movie. John Wayne made an astonishing number of movies, if you count all the way back to the very beginning of his career. And he was always considered by the people he worked with to be one of the hardest working actors in the business. He was asked, oh, I think when he was in his um, probably late 50s, I think it was, he was asked if he were rich because of course actors are supposed to be rich. And he said, no. He said he'd had too many wives, too many bad investments, and too much fun to become rich. That's why he explained he had to keep on making movies and the more the better, he needed the money. Love and marriage <laughs> weren't in the cards for John Wayne in terms of one of those, we marry and we live happily ever after. It just didn't work out that way. He was married three times and all three of his marriages ended badly. Josephine Sands, Josie, who's pictured here, was wife number one. And then there was Esperanza Barr. And then finally, Pilar Palette. Wayne met Josie when she was 15 years old and he was in college at Southern Cal. They developed a relationship. She was from a, a very well-known, well, very wealthy family, and of course, Wayne was not. But they fell in love, and, and her family finally accepted him, and so they did eventually marry. She was legal, she was of age. And they had four children, two boys and two girls, but they divorced in 1945. Wayne had a bit of a wandering eye, and Josie decided she really wasn't gonna put up with that. 
even though they divorced, they remained very, very close throughout the remainder of his life. Um, they both adored their children, and so they put those children first, and that made it very easy for them to get along. They're very proud of their kids. Josie was a devout Catholic, and she did not remarry until after Wayne's death. This is Bauer, Bauer and Wayne. She was a very interesting person, and she brought with her um, a set of interesting problems. He married her in 1946. He met her while he was on vacation in Mexico City, and his eye had wandered. She was a very jealous woman, and she constantly accused Wayne of having affairs with every leading lady he'd ever worked with, which was not true, but she was convinced it was. She was so mad at him one evening when he came in from a movie shoot that she actually shot at him with a gun. They had no children. The divorce was unbelievably acrimonious. He said she was a drunk, which it turns out she was. She said he was guilty of domestic violence, which it turned out that he did throw a pillow or two at her. The divorce itself took two years to complete, and the judge was the happiest one of all of them when it was finally over. In 54, he married Pilar, a Latina actress. He'd met her earlier when he was scouting filming locations in Peru, which was her home country. They had three children, and Pilar quit her acting career to be with Wayne and to take care of the children. They separated after 20 years, uh, but they never legally divorced, and they too stayed close. Wayne was accused of having many um, affairs, but the, the truth is he, he really didn't have that many. Um, the one that I think is the most interesting, certainly the one that I found the most surprising was his affair with Marlena Dietrich uh, when they were filming Seven Sinners. During the last seven years of his life, you now he's, you know, he and Josie are divorced, he and Pilar are separated, but everybody's kind of friendly. Byer had died. During the last seven years of his life, his closest companion was a woman who had been his former secretary, Pat Stacy Donahue. She was born in Louisiana. She graduated from ULM at the time that it was in OU, and she pursued a, a career as a teacher, and that career eventually put her in California. After a career of over 50 years, and appearing in 120 feature films, actually over 200 in all if you count those early B films, one television series, and directing two pictures, Wayne lost to his strongest opponent, cancer. In 1964, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. For two years prior to this, he had an incredibly vicious cough, but he was working. He was doing some of his best film work. And the producers were so impressed and the directors with the way he was working and how he was developing those characters that when he would have a coughing fit, they would just stop everything. He would get control of it and they would go forward and film again. Um, he was a five pack a day smoker from college days of camels unfiltered. And so the lung cancer probably shouldn't have been a surprise, but it surprised him. He just kept thinking he just had a cough. For that episode, he had to have a lung removed and he had several ribs that were removed, but he fought back and he insisted that he was gonna be fine. And so then he did a series of films that were also excellent films, 
although his physical stamina was noticeably less. But it worked beautifully for the films that he was in because he was an older, aging gunfighter or ex-sheriff or whatever. And so he looked the role better than he would have looked if he had looked healthy. In 1979, cancer returned. This time it was in his stomach. He had to have his stomach removed, his gallbladder removed, and a pretty significant portion of his lower intestine removed. In 1979, on June 12th, he lost the battle. He died at the UCLA Medical Center. And on his death certificate, the cause of death is listed as complications from cancer. Wayne was a young man still. He was 72, but cancer had won. An excerpt from his obituary reads, the movies he starred in rode the range from out of the money, money sagebrush quickies to such classics as Stagecoach and Red River. He won an Oscar as best actor for another Western, True Grit in 1969. Yet some of the best films he made told stories far from the wilds of the West, such as The Quiet Man and The Long Voyage Home. Wayne was buried in Pacific View Memorial Park near Newport Beach, which was one of his favorite places in the whole world. But at, for 20 years, his grave was left unmarked at his family's request because they didn't want it to become a tourist attraction. When the marker was finally put in place, the inscription read this. Tomorrow is the most important thing in life. Comes into us at midnight, very clean. It's perfect when it arrives and it puts itself in our hands. It hopes we've learned something from yesterday. John Wayne, 1907, 1979. One of the fiercest movie critics, Terry Curtis Fox, had this to say about Wayne. Wayne was never, despite the endlessly repeated words of his eulogists, a vision of what Americans dream themselves to be. He was a vision of what Americans wished their past had been. He was a man who had no place in the modern psychological world and every bit of his performing presence told us that. I pulled out a few little interesting things that most people don't know about John Wayne that Iman was very careful that we knew, those of us who read the book, and you should too. Here are the things that most don't know. The first one I find hilarious. His favorite songs were, People Will Say We're In Love Until The End Of Time, Three Marriages, not happy, but his favorite songs are love songs. <laughs> he loved reading in bed. He was extremely well read. He especially loved Agatha Christie, Raymond Chandler, Rex Stout, Winston Churchill, Keats, Byron, Shakespeare. And on the sets, he would frequently quote John Milton, the British poet. His favorite movies were Cary Grant movies. From 1950 until he died, he had to wear a toupee because he had, he was growing bald, he just was losing his hair. But he only wore it when he was filming or when he was making a public appearance, like at the Oscars or something like that. Just every day on the street, if you saw him, he would be bald. He didn't have any problem with that at all. When he made the movie Hondo, they were shooting it in Mexico and the temperatures were absolutely brutal. Every day, 100 degrees or higher. And Hondo's dog, a scruffy looking dog that really almost stole that movie from Wayne and all the rest of them, that dog was played by the dog that played Lassie. They just dirtied him up a little bit and made him look scruffy and there he was. And during the shoot, some of the local children in Mexico realized the value of Hondo's dog, so they kidnapped the dog and they held it for ransom and they paid the ransom and the dog came back and finished the movie. 
On a really cold location shoot in France, Wayne had hand warmers built into his underpants so that they covered his kidneys, key to his body warmth. And he also remembered from growing up, his growing up days to fold newspapers in his shoes to help keep his feet warm. He was a really fine poker player, but he was a better chess player. And he always insisted that a chess board be set up on the set where he was shooting. So when he was not in the scene, he could be playing chess with anybody who could play with him. Once he turned down the role of the crazed cowboy in Dr. Strangelove, that role later went to Slim Pickens. He also co-owned a cattle ranch, which I thought that was kind of fascinating too. And it was a big one. It was called the Bar 26. And he had it for many years and on it he bred red and white Herefords and sold only the high-end breeding bulls and heifers. He also had an addiction. It was not to liquor. I guess cigarettes would count as one. But the one I was interested in was he loved mail order catalogs. And he would order from them in bulk, he said, because he had so many grandchildren, he had to. His personal favorite actor of all the actors was James Garner. He said that Garner could do anything on film and make it believable. And then he was such a fan of Southern Cow that when he was dying in the UCLA Medical Center, of course, he was given a UCLA baseball cap. So he wore his Southern cow cap underneath it. And when he would meet somebody in the hall, he would lift the UCLA cap and show them the Southern cow cap. One of the things that he said when he was fighting his cancer the last time, was, I don't mind being old. I just mind not being able to move. I think that's the way we would all feel about it, wouldn't he? So the Duke, John Wayne, true American legend. He was a bigger than life actor on the screen, but he was a bigger than life man in his private life. I really hope you'll take some time to look at perhaps some of the movies that we've mentioned. I hope there'll be some that you've seen before. And if you're in the younger set and you haven't discovered John Wayne, you need to go back and take a look. Uh, there's a lot there to be seen. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've certainly enjoyed doing the research for you.